today we're doing something I have never done before and I haven't seen a lot of people play with this. We are making whiskey with Kvaik yeast. Woo! How's it going Chasers? I hope you're having a kick-ass week. I'm Jesse and this is still at the channel all about chasing the craft of home distillation and making it a legitimate hobby. Yes, I am doing the uh, the YouTuber thing. Warm key light, cold LED background because it is absolutely pissing down outside right now. I cannot hear myself think in the shed. But we are doing something super, super exciting today, guys. We're using Kvaik, specifically Hornendahl from Omega, uh, to make a whiskey with and see if it's applicable, if it works for whiskey, and if the interesting flavors that it creates are going to carry over. So first of all, I want to walk you through these steps uh, and tell you exactly how I made this stuff, both for the control that I'm going to be tasting it against and the Hornendahl whiskey. After that, we can talk about why Kvike has taken the brewing world by storm, why it's so amazing, and of course, taste test. Last week, I put out a video showing a basic whiskey wash. You can check the card up here if you want to go back and watch it. Now, the wash that I made in that video, like the literal same wash that I made in that vid video, is what I used to ferment for this experiment with the Hornendale. So, if you want to see exactly how I made that, you can go back and watch that video. You know, click the link up here or find it in the description down below. Uh, or if you want to make it yourself, you can do that as well. Anyway, so that wash was transferred into a fermenter at 40 degrees celsius that is i don't know what that is in fahrenheit it's really fucking hot though yeah <laughs> hold on <laughs> 40 that is 104 degrees fahrenheit now that wasn't just the temperature we transferred out that was actually the pitching temperature i fermented this at 104 degrees fahrenheit or 40 degrees celsius now, here's the thing guys, with um, these Kvike yeasts, obviously the different strains have different flavors that they generate, different ester profiles that they go after, but the general suggestion is that if you want as much of those estery flavors and profiles as you can get out of them, uh, the idea is that you underpitch, underpitch for normal yeast uh, and ferment it hot, like 40 degrees Celsius. That's exactly what I did because I wanted to see how much of that fruity flavor uh, from the Hornendahl would carry over into the final spirit. So 40 degrees Celsius fermentation temperature controlled with an STC 1000 and I pitched two teaspoons, <laughs> two teaspoons of this liquid slurry uh, into the wort. By the next morning it was absolutely humming and the entire room smelt like tropical fruit. Now uh, Hornendale themselves I think describe it as uh, pineapple, pineapple, mango and mandarin. I agree with the mango, I kind of agree with the ma mandarin and the pineapple. Uh, to me it was more like pawpaw, mango and passion fruit. That's what it smelt like when it was fermenting and what the wort tastes like when it was done as well. It fermented out in three days. Bam, done, which isn't surprising at 40 degrees Celsius. Uh, I let it go for another two days just to see if anything new would happen. It didn't. Uh, I turned the temperature off, let it drop down to room temperature just until I could get it in the still. Now, the wort at this point in time uh, tasted like tropical fruit, those descriptors I gave you before. 100% tasted like that, but it was clean, man. I was expecting some off flavors, uh, honestly, but it wasn't. Other than those esters, clean. So I put that thing into the still, distilled it with two plates uh, and did a single spirit run from scratch with it. After cuts I ended up with this here. Now of note during the heads at the beginning of the run it did come across more like pineapple. Uh, during the hearts it was more the passion fruit pawpaw and near the tails it almost went all the way through to uh, milk chocolate. Not, not chocolate malt, milk chocolate. Very, very interesting. So now that you know how I made it, let's get into uh, talking about what Kvike is and of course tasting it. But first, 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 Patreons. Thank you so much, guys. I cannot do this stuff without you. I can't experiment like this without you. So thank you so much, guys. I appreciate it. I really, really do. If you're enjoying these videos, if you're finding value in them or in the Chase the Craft podcast and you'd like to help support Chase the Craft to keep it going, uh, you can visit chasethecraft.com slash support where you'll find all the different ways that you can help out, including, you know, if it's right for you, Patreon. 
All right guys, so Kvike, what the hell is it? Why is it so special and where did it come from? Kvike is essentially the word for yeast in certain dialects in Norway, as I understand it. Correct me if I'm, in, if I'm wrong about that. Uh, but it is a, in Norway, traditionally it's a collection of yeasts. It's not a single strain of yeasts that have just been used in farmhouses for like literally centuries. And over that time, it's developed certain properties that are kind of, that are out there, man, they're different than normal yeast. You can ferment it in a huge temperature range and it will perform well in that temperature range, which is exceptionally interesting for distillers um, that potentially don't have, you know, really nice temperature controlled environments like a lot of brewers do. So if you live in an area where it's really cold during winter and really hot during summer, uh, Gvike will rip through your stuff. It doesn't matter which end of that spectrum you ferment at, it'll do a really good job. Uh, number two is the stuff is hardy as hell. It loves being underpitched on, you know, conventional beer and spirits sort of standards. The advised pitching rate, if you're after the esters that it'll provide, is one teaspoon per 23 or 25 litres of wort. Now that is generally for beer brewers, so I'm sort of calling that around the 1.050 original gravity range. If you're pushing it up to 1075, 1080, um, maybe pop a little bit more in. I use two teaspoons, so that's 10 mils of yeast, uh, but this was also an old pack, so I was sort of accounting for that. Traditionally, they literally dry it out and sprinkle it back in, or they have these, these ropes or almost like wreaths that they dunk the yeast into the yeast, they let it dry, and then they sort of swish that around in the next batch. So when you buy one of these, this literally cost me like 30 bucks. By the time I paid for the yeast and postage and got it to my house, 30 bucks, which is pretty crazy. But in another video later on, I'll show you how I'm gonna make that go a whole lot further uh, than a normal pack of yeast would. And this stuff will hold up to that sort of treatment. And the, and the last thing is the crazy flavors that this stuff can create. Uh, now that it's sort of been brought into labs and it's been propagated, you know, by people like Y Yeast, by Amiga, they're starting to isolate certain strains or collections of strains to produce a very specific flavor profile in different directions. So do you want a whole lot of citrus? Cool, I've got one for that. Uh, do you want the, the tropical fruit thing, which is what I was after with this? Got one for that. I will leave descriptions down below to a few Kvike strains that I would love to try when I can get my hands on them. Uh, but anyway guys, let's get into tasting. But I made my cuts and ended up with this here. So now we can taste it. And uh, I'll be honest, let's, let's be honest, I've already done this, but you know, for the sake of Spectre and YouTube, Straight off the bat, you notice a sweetness to the spirit that I don't normally get. And I'll try it next to the other one, the control soon. But it is not a sugar sweetness. It is the perception of sweetness. Um, the fruity flavors that go along with it make it seem sweet and thick. I think, I think that's what it is. Now, what am I actually getting in the glass in terms of sweetness? It's very much the pour pour. Very much that subtle, um, almost fruit salad-y kind of tropical fruit taste but interestingly enough if you think of pawpaw or uh, papaya depending on where you're from it almost has a savory unctuousness to it that borderlines on being umami or meat sometimes and i'm getting a lot of that out of it the pineapple hasn't shown up here at all i wonder if i let it sit for a while that might come back the passion fruit is there but just a tiny wee bit the main ester that's coming through is that pawpaw note. Perhaps a touch of mango-iness, but, but not so much. Now the control, uh, spoiler alert, is the first thing that I'm gonna be submitting to the great Base Malt Co. Lab, which is 100% distiller's malt from Gladfield. Obviously following all the rules for the Base Malt Co. Lab, so it's USO5. Uh, this is exactly the same. Everything about it is the same, other than the fact that it's Hornendale rather than USO5. Yeah, so that fruit component just isn't there. <laughs> it's not there. You know what? After tasting that, I do think some of the chocolate has come through. Which is interesting. I haven't really tasted a chocolate like this in a whiskey before. Every time I've had chocolate, it is either like super dark chocolate, more like 85% chocolate, almost going through into like chocolate malt, right? So it's um, almost coffee, it's, it's kind of acrid or it tastes like really cheap, crappy uh, 
chocolate that is kind of like cocoa powder and cremelta. This tastes like, subtly, I'll admit, very subtly, like really nice milk chocolate. That's quite crazy. I think it is important to say that all these things that I'm calling out are not off the charts. They are relatively subtle, but there is a big difference between these, between these two spirits. This tastes just like grain. Funnily enough, it's grain in USO5. This has a whole lot more going to it. Uh, and I am still struggling through the fact that this is, um, this was only proofed yesterday. This was proofed a month ago. So I, I think the, the subtleties of this might open up and develop a little more over the next few weeks. There is definitely something to it guys, definitely something to it. So there you have it team, a whiskey made from Hornendal yeast. Do the flavors carry through? Hell yes they do. Do they do interesting things to the whiskey? Hell yes they do. Uh, what are they gonna do to a whiskey when you age it on wood? <laughs> <laughs> I have no freaking idea. If you've used Hornendal to make a whiskey, please drop a comment in the comment section down below and uh, let us know what you've found from your little experiment. If you've used other kinds of kvike yeast or you have kvike yeast that you think could work well for uh, for whiskey, please guys drop them down below too because I guarantee you people are going to be looking for it and asking for it after this video. This is only the tip of the iceberg with this stuff. I'm definitely going to be playing with it more. Uh, I think it could be fun for rum. I think it could be fun for a lot of things, uh, but obviously it's going to take a whole lot more testing and a whole lot more experimenting. So if you enjoyed this video, make sure you give it a thumbs up, guys. If you like content like this, if you like seeing videos like this, please do subscribe down below. Hit the notification bell as well so you don't miss out on anything. Uh, and if you could, if there's people that you know of that you think might enjoy this video, that are playing with Kvike, that aren't distilling, or that are distilling and are not playing with Kvike, share it with them. Let them know it exists. That helps me out a whole lot. All right, guys, keep on chasing the craft. Until next time, see ya.